Hello everyone and welcome to our unit called Modern and Contemporary Literature. We have finally reached not only the 20th century, but also the final unit of the year. Before we get started, I just really want to encourage you guys, you have been doing so well trekking along with all of these videos. And I know you have them not just for my class, but all of your other classes. So I really want to encourage you, keep up with the high energy and the positive attitude. We just have about two more weeks to go. You got this. So in this unit, we're really just looking at two central things in terms of how we identify modernist literature. And the first of that is looking at the characteristics that really shape this genre, this new movement of literature, and the big way in which we understand and identify those characteristics is understanding how certain key events in the 20th century, we can even talk about the 21st century now, right? have impacted and influenced this movement as a whole. And the second thing that we're going to do is read and appreciate two classic examples of modern and contemporary literature. And in doing those readings, which I'll introduce to you in a moment, we're looking particularly at how we can identify those key characteristics of modernist literature, but also looking at things we're already very familiar with, so point of view and theme in particular. So this unit is very accessible, very quick, and it is very nice in my opinion because we're getting closer to literature that we can relate with, right, in terms of being able to connect with the texts. So the first of the two short stories we're going to be reading for our discussion of modern and contemporary literature is the famous short story by Franz Kafka called Metamorphosis. This is a beautiful short story, you guys, albeit weird in the beginning, but when we really un pack what's going on in the text, the lessons that it has to tell, and so this is where we're going to be looking at um, themes for, for the most part, right, are profound. And it's profound, right, in a sense, because Kafka makes beautiful use of combining those things from mythology that we learned about in the beginning of the year, but also in our most recent unit, elements of realism. And the second thing that he tackles is that he looks at issues of transformation and alienation. So alienation, right, in the terms of feeling separated, primarily emotionally, from those around you, but even oftentimes from yourself and what you're feeling. The second and final short story, so this will be the last story that we're going to read together as a class, is called The Guest by Albert Camus. So as you can tell by my awful accent, he is a French author. And his short story deals primarily with these issues of war and colonialism, something that we're going to talk about heavily in terms of introducing what was happening in the 20th century, right? But he also talks about the lasting consequences of our decision making. Right. And how our life is often altered, not just by the decisions that we make, but also things that are far outside of our control. And I feel that this short story, when we get to it in our coming videos, is one that you will definitely be able to connect with. So let's go ahead and look at the first sort of historical backdrop that we need to understand, the first of two for this unit, and that is the fact that the 20th century presented a changing world that was defined by conflict. So some of you who are either history buffs or science buffs, you'll know very well what that picture on the right is, and that is indeed the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. So we're going to be talking about conflict in this first part of understanding history. And in the 19 or the 20th century, so in the 1900s, we have World War One and World War Two that are not very far off from one another, and it's marked by unprecedented loss. And the first time, right, with World War One, where we see conflict taking on a, a global scale. We also have issues in terms of the Cold War. So Cold War meaning that it wasn't actually active fighting, right? But it's more of this, this struggle against, for example, those who hold the ideals of democracy and capitalism versus those who hold the ideals of communism. And you have all of this sort of fear stirring up in terms of American society, at least, uh, of communism. And so whole wars uh, created sort of to, to defeat that ideal or that structure of power that so, so frightened so many people. 
And then along with this, we also not just have war on an epic scale, but violence on an epic scale. And we see this even beginning with World War I, right? Even though it took place in the earlier part of the 20th century, it's uh, sort of easy to, to forget that they actually had their own advancements in terms of warfare. And so with World War I, we have the introduction of not just biological weapons, but chemical weapons. And then, of course, as you know, when it comes to World War II, we have the emergence of the atom bomb. And so on a sort of bright side, if we can call it that, right, the advancement in terms of biological and chemical weapons show that technology and science is raving and booming in the 20th century. But there's this negative side of science, this darker side of science, right, that people are going to, to pick up on. And now we're moving to the second part of the sort of history that we need to understand to understand the, the 20th century and modern literature. And that is that we have this idea of the changing world, but in terms of being defined by change. So it's a century defined not just by conflict, but by the change that's going on. And I put this political cartoon on the right to, to sort of highlight one of the big issues of the 20th century, and even still continuing into the 21st century, this idea of this huge gap in wealth between those who have, meaning they're wealthy, and those who do not, and how we sort of have this idea of people who, who don't have wealth are in the vast majority, and those who do have wealth are in the minority, and they really don't do much to sort of reach out and, and change that status, right, for obvious reasons. So in terms of a century defined by change, we have movements for independence. So again, this is where we're going to recall what we talked about in terms of the guest just a moment ago, that short story by Albert Camus. And we have the, the backdrop of countries who have been dominated by colonialism and they no longer want to be under the control of a foreign power and so you have movements arising for independence particularly in Africa which will be the the setting for our story in the guest and also in Asia and additionally at the same time right you also have this sort of global interdependence which seems kind of counterintuitive. So at one point you have nations who are seeking to gain control uh, over themselves as, as, a, as a country, right? But at the same time, this understanding that's, that's growing, that we need as a globe, right, because of how we've advanced in terms of being able to create and produce and to trade, we need each other. So this is where we get introduced to this term globalization which is essentially a fancy word for saying that the world has become smaller, not geographically in the sense that its shape or its size has changed, but that we become more connected, right? You can see that even in our distance learning program, right? We're no longer face to face with one another, but we're able to connect, right? And if you really wanted to, if you had not a question about something we were studying, you could connect with students from all over the world, teachers from all over the world to help you. And so with that comes enormous benefit, right? But you also have this pushback and this risk in terms of a loss of culture. So this balance of as I become more interconnected with the world around me, as I become more dependent on technology and, and other cultures, how does that change my home culture? And how does that change my own traditions and my own beliefs? And then finally, as I introduced a moment ago, we have this widening gap between the rich and the poor. So although we have greater access to consumer goods, right? This comes at a cost of not only do you have more people living in heavily populated urban areas, so putting a strain on resources, but people now have access to, to gaining and getting as much as they want. And those who are well below the poverty line are kind of left behind without a second thought. So this is going to be the backdrop then for how we look at modernism in terms of literature. So understanding that the world has changed and it changed guys in just the, the term of, of a century, right? When before when we studied text and you should have picked up on this, you have gradual changes taking place over thousands of years, right? Not just centuries. And then all of a sudden you have this huge increase in terms of the, the world's ability to change and adapt and to, to progress. 
And so this is what modernism is going to sort of highlight and confront. Turning then to the modernist movement, so meaning modernist literature, we're going to talk about three key defining features. And the first is that we have writers who now have the mind, the human mind, as the main subject. So exploring really the depths and the capacity of the human mind to think and to process and focusing on that thought process. And I want to sort of put this in, in contrast to how we viewed realism, because realism, just our unit from, from not even a week ago, right, focused on sort of characters, what's going on with them, right? But now we're not just concerned of what's going on with them and how the plot is moving, but we want to see what's going on in their mind. And out of this focus on the mind comes what be, becomes known as the stream of consciousness. And this is a technique that's used in writing, particularly in characterization, right? So shaping a character where you now have narrators through or authors right through their narrators giving off rapid and jumbled flow of character thought and feelings as they occur so it's as if you as the reader get access into the mind of your character unfiltered right so this is a, a new and unique feature and something characteristic and beautiful about modernism the second defining feature that I see is innovative style and form. And so one thing that I want to make clear is that, so those of you who are very into poetry, when I say style and form, immediately you're going to go there. And you're right to. So this portion of modernism does focus on poetry, but it also pertains to novels as well. And this involves breaking new ground, right, uh, in terms of making things new. Right? So Ezra Pound, a very famous poet, coining this phrase of always make it new. That's how you, how you engage your reader and how you grow in terms of style and form. So we see this abandoning of the traditional stanza form and meter, in particular for poetry, right? which is where we come to free verse, what we learned about last year with Walt Whitman as the father of free verse. But you also see it in novels as well. So for example, you have James Joyce and his novel Ulysses and how this is an interesting sort of take and twist on the Odyssey, right? Homer's The Odyssey, and how he also sort of dives into the mind of these characters. And guys, beautiful examples of modern literature, but ones that sort of break the mold in terms of what was acceptable in the past. So one thing you could say about the previous unit in this one is that we're continuing to see as humans advance in terms of technology and access and being able to produce and to trade, you also see this advancement in writers sort of breaking the, the chains of tradition that came from before. And then lastly, that final defining feature is a focus on anxiety and alienation. And what better focus, right, than, than talking about that right now in the midst of a quarantine, right? It's very easy now to feel anxious and to feel like you're alienated from the world around you. And this is something that writers in the modern period also felt very deeply, right? Not just because they're coming off of the foot of World War One, World War Two, and the Cold War, and that's just to name a few of them. But also you have these uprisings going on all over the place. As people are advancing in terms of technology, you sort of have this loss of culture and loss of tradition. So really, you, rapid changing and, and not being able to, to process that and work through that. And so when we talk about defining features in terms of anxiety and alienation, we're going to see in literature a world that's portrayed as a wasteland, a land marked by violence, marked by anxiety. And as a result, the characters that we see are often going to be alienated, meaning they're emotionally withdrawn from society, but also sometimes from themselves. And this is going to be a key player when we begin to look next week at metamorphosis and our central character is going to suffer severely from anxiety and from alienation. So just again to get you in the, the mood and the picture of the modernist movement, I chose two quotes from two modernist authors that hopefully you're familiar with. 
um, if not by their name, by the title of a work that has made them famous. And the first is Joseph Conrad, and he is the writer of The Heart of Darkness, a beautiful book. I highly recommend that you read it. And he says this, My task, which I am trying to achieve, is, by the power of the written word, to make you hear, to make you feel. It is, before all, to make you see. So again, to make you see in terms of not just what you see on the page, in terms of imagery, but visualizing what is going on inside of the thoughts and feelings and emotion of my character, right? In terms of Joseph Conrad, right? Someone who wrote about anxiety and alienation in particular, looking at those feelings and processing them in a, in a deeper and more novel way. And the second author is Virginia Wolf. Uh, she is particularly famous for how her writings worked to achieve equality for, for women. And she has this to say, let us record the atoms as they fall upon the mind in the order in which they fall. Let us trace the pattern, however disconnected and incoherent in appearance. Right? And I love this quote, right? Not just for, um, just the, the diction and the eloquence, but it also is a beautiful image of sometimes how modernist literature can at first seem disconnected and seem incoherent. But that's the beauty of it. Between all of these lines that seem to go nowhere, when we pull back that curtain and we really truly connect and understand, we see it through these streams of, uh, of consciousness. In, in our characters and what's going on in the story, we see that everything, right, pieces itself together. So sort of making order out of, of chaos. With that being said, here are just six strategies to help you in your reading for the two short stories that we're doing. So this is an addition, right, to number six. So monitoring the reading strategies we learned at the very beginning of the year. And the first is to visualize what you see and question, ask yourself, what do I see? What is the narrator showing me? Not just about the, the setting, but what's going on with my characters. You also should pay attention to what's modern about it in terms of its subject and style. So asking yourself, what makes the work original or distinctive? Which of those three defining features or, or more, right, do I see in the text? And the third, being alert to anything that's contradictory or inconsistent, right? So we've already had good practice with this in terms of how much land does a man need, right? And pointing out sort of those things that didn't quite fit and how the, that led to foreshadowing and ultimately the theme, right? Because oftentimes in that contradictory or inconsistency, the theme or the tone of the story is revealed. But also, number four, we need to remember to be patient because some of this text is going to be complex and complex not to scare you, but because modernist literature relies heavily on suggestion, meaning that I can't be a passive reader, sit back, read through at great speed and think I'm going to understand. Right? It's something where I really need to engage with the text on a deeper level. right? And so it's okay if you read through something once and you're finding that it's not making a lot of sense. Read through it again, right? And then this is what we're going to unpack together through the videos. And then five, determine the writer's view of the modern world. So through the way that they write and through the thoughts that are revealed in their characters, do they have a bleak or optimistic view of the world? And how do you know that? This is going to be it for video number 29. So video number 30, which I will be posting on Monday, I would like you to read part one of Metamorphosis. So Metamorphosis is broken down into three parts okay, in your literature textbook. So just read part one. So that will be page 1110 to 1122 of your literature textbook. I will try to find a PDF copy that matches the textbook as well for those of you who perhaps don't have access to the book. And you can read this at your own pace, guys. So if you want to read that all today, by all means, more power to you. If you want to space it out and read a little bit at a time, just know that I will be posting the video explaining that portion on Monday. Okay, so this, in a sense, is just to give you your own space to, to pace your reading as you like. Okay, 
Thanks for watching, and I will see you on Monday for our dive into the first part of Franz Kafka's The Metamorphosis.